the artist's horse. Ever since antiquity, artists have drawn, painted, and sculpted the horse. This ink drawing from the 1500s, based on an allegory of painting and sculpture, reminded a Renaissance art apprentice to proficiently learn the importance of visually understanding equine features from every point of sight, its muscles, its movements, its proportions. Notice that over time the white lead highlights have returned to its original source as a bluish-gray metal ore. Having a horse in or near an artist's workplace is nothing new, especially if a favored horse had been requested for a commissioned equestrian portrait. This was a common practice during the Renaissance, when painters like da Vinci for the Sforza Monument or Van Dyck in the Royal English Courts would be provided a ground-level workshop, whereby they could peer out the windows or opened double doors into a courtyard where a groom would present the horse. This enabled the artist to study the animal direct from the life without having to visit the stables. Even in his own house in Antwerp, Peter Paul Rubens' workshop opened directly to an inner courtyard. Animal painters like Paulus Potter, Rosa Bonheur, George Stubbs, and Horace Burnett would apparently continue this custom in their own studios, or some artists would go directly to the source, no matter the season. In the 15 into the 1600s, most artists would basically portray a stylized horse based on the classical measurements of ancient Greek and Roman equestrian statues. Equine dissections were also common, however many artists throughout Europe would rely on the contemporary flayed sculptures like this one. The Tory horse is a bronze anatomical sculpture of a horse created by a Renaissance artist in Florence around 1585. It is about 35 inches high and served as a study for the training of art apprentices. Sculptures like this one were vital in the workshops as visual three-dimensional references that could be arranged from any angle, from any light direction, and under any variable light conditions, highly useful for the compositional designs of paintings. It was a practical procedure for many years which is perhaps one reason why the Renaissance horse in paintings are depicted in a very homogeneous manner. While the Dutch painter and printmaker Hercules Sagers likely observed a bronze statue or a print of this rearing horse, he nonetheless developed an innovative manner of execution. Sagers was an experimental artist ahead of his time, and his work was admired by his fellow artists, but not by the collectors of his day. His lifetime struggles to earn a living from his art, and the obsessive passion he had for art, practically mirrors that of Vincent van Gogh. To learn more about Sagers, a European artist heritage presentation has been produced about him. Next, a brief comparison will be presented between two book publications, one from the 17th century and the other from the 19th century, both of which illustrate the anatomy of the horse according to the prevalent artistic manner of their day and the ideal representation of the popular horse types respective to that century. We begin with Christian von Passy's extensive drawing book published in 1643. The title page is shown here. In his publication, the artist primarily depicted the favored classical horse type. Note its long mane and tail, a thick arched neck, subconvex profile, 
a rounded croup, and a low tail set, all characteristics of a sturdy horse type that was desired by royalty, high-ranking diplomats, and military officers of the 15 and 1600s. Van Passe also included proportion and the horse foreshortened in perspective boxes dependent on point-of-sight considerations. The Artistic Anatomy of the Horse by Hawkins, published in 1866, presents a more romanticized horse rather than a classical one. Select image plates reveal the preferred horse type of this century by the gentry, one that is more fine-boned, having a shorter, well-defined croup with a higher tail set, a slender arched neck, and wild eyes. Hawkins also includes the look of the older horse, with its protruding hip bones, languid walk, and dropped head, in the appearance of Don Quixote's horse, as another romanticized consideration. Of interest, Hawkins' Artistic Anatomy of the Horse was published by Windsor & Newton, the manufacturer of artists' oil colors and materials. A fascinating catalog of their 19th century art products can be found at the end of this publication. Equine artists from all the centuries would always study the horse from the life, whether for a specific portrait of a horse, for a compositional design, or for a reserve of visual reference sources. Renaissance artists like da Vinci, Rubens, Velazquez, Van Dyck, and Rembrandt would observe the horse directly from the life for more realistic portrayals, rather than resorting to the customary drawing books, prints, or outdated bronze sculptures. 19th century artists like Gericault, Mensel, and Constable would also achieve a higher standard of realism by learning the horse from the life. Changes would take place rapidly in the 1800s with the invention of photography. Undistorted, still photo images like these enabled the equine artist to better judge the muscle structure and conformation of the various horse breeds in standing profile. Yet, at the same time, such photographs of equine portraits would also put the horse portrait painter out of business. This brown ink drawing, shown only in black and white, is by the Italian artist Pisanello, who was a painter, draftsman, sculptor, maker of medallions, and an illuminator in the early 1400s. This small drawing, only six and a quarter by seven and three quarter inches, is apparently from one of his personal sketchbooks. Notice the seam down the middle and lace holes to bound the book pages. Such booklets were known in the Dutch as tafaletten or tavola in Italian. These pocket-sized Renaissance books contained 12 to 14 erasable sheets of paper intended to be used over and over again. 
This particular one contains drawing exercises and copies after prints and was likely owned by a painter's apprentice. The 17th century Dutch artist Adrian van der Werf would use his sketchbook to record the amount of time used to finish a picture, making calculations on how much the painting would cost. Another Dutch artist, Paulus Potter, apparently kept a pocketbook when he would take an outdoor walk with his wife in case he saw something interesting to be immediately sketched. Returning to this beautiful study of horse heads by Pisanello, the drawing was purchased by the Louvre Museum in 1856 from Giuseppe Velardi, an art collector and dealer who had in his possession 375 folios of rare early Italian Renaissance drawings, to include many by Pisanello. This stunning acquisition has become known as the Codex Velardi. More Renaissance drawings follow. Stop on each image for a better concentration. The history on this painting has been interesting. Until recently, the unfinished work had been associated with Anthony van Dyck and was exhibited as such in 1955. However, recent examination and restoration has concluded that it is an original oil study by Rubens. This Rubens oil sketch, like many others, was extended to a larger size to accommodate a landscape completed by another hand. This was a common practice in the 1800s for art dealers to make artworks more sellable. Note the typical 19th century execution of the landscape, the added coloring of the yellow jacket, and the unsuitable cowboy-style hat. New developments in conservation techniques have allowed the overpaint to be successfully removed and to reveal the oil sketch in its original state. Its attribution has been confirmed by the directors of the Rubens House Museum and the Rubinium. This large-scale oil sketch can be dated to the early 1610s, when Rubens made a series of equestrian studies for use in both portraits and Historia pictures. These studies served as modellos for his studio assistants who would help the master to cope with the increasing demands of his time. Three of the equestrian poses Rubens used often can be seen in this panel in the Royal Collection Trust. This panel is likely the result of a student training exercise from a pupil in Rubens' studio who copied the now lost original oil sketch by the master. The lost oil sketch by Rubens of all three horse poses was formerly in the Kaiser Friedrich Museum in Berlin, destroyed in 1945 by fire. Meanwhile, what happened to the other two horse studies that would have accompanied the recently revealed rear-view pose pictured in the middle? Apparently, they are existent. However, no image of the two have gone public and remain in private hands. The dapple gray horse in profile on the right has been discovered in a private collection in England, having also been overpainted with a landscape. The location of the frontal horse on the left currently remains unknown, 
but was previously in the collection of the Earls of Potterlington in England up to the mid-20th century. Likely some time ago, the three were cut apart for a greater sellability. The two equine poses in private hands match the centered piece according to identical height size and to having a plain background and to be on a canvas support. A museum visit follows, a gallery of equine images that reveal the creative contemplations and visual practices of working artists from the 17th to the 19th centuries. Pause on those images you wish to study with more concentration. This equine portrait was completed by three painters. An original label on the back of the canvas states that it was given to Monsieur Monet by Lord Bolingbroke in 1766, that the horse was by Stubbs, the landscape by Claude Joseph Farnett, and the figures by Francis Brochur. Constable spent the winter of 1815 to 1816 in East Burkholt, Suffolk, England, with his dying father when this oil sketch was done, likely from the life. At an unknown date, probably following Constable's death, the sketch was mounted on a piece of wood and the paint extended about an inch in all directions. Artists would employ the works of past masters as reference sources. This is not considered copying, whereby one steals the work of another or duplicates it verbatim to produce an expressionless, lifeless imitation which lacks originality, spontaneity, and innovation. In the following example, 
the 19th century French painter Theodore Gericault looked at a 16th century etching by the Renaissance German master Albrecht Dürer for his oil sketch of a modern-day hussar. Gericault would take what he purposed from the etching to produce a work of art compatible to his day, while retaining his own working manner and unique natural art ability. This work is an oil sketch for a larger, ambitious equestrian portrait of Queen Victoria. The final painting failed to materialize after 30 years of many false starts and attempts by the artist. In 2018, I experienced an extensive exhibition of Degas' art at the Denver Art Museum. It included an entire gallery dedicated to Degas' passion for the horse. One of the paintings displayed was this one, a medieval war scene upon which I focused on the details of this Palomino horse. Degas had beautifully captured a Spanish-type horse when, in his day, depicting the romanticized Arabian horse, was in vogue. Despite the painting's unfinished look, the work, not shown in its entirety due to nudity, was accepted by the Salon in Paris and went unnoticed. 
Another painting in the Denver exhibit was this one. Clearly, Degas had an understanding of dressage to capture the prancing, balanced movement of this elegant horse. Like most artists of his day, running horses were depicted in the action of a flying gallop, since the gait happened too fast to fully and correctly analyze. Note, however, that Degas accurately captured the strain of the jockey, leaning back in his seat as he struggles to control an unruly racehorse. The scene appears to be of a match race between two horses. Degas often positioned small wooden horses or chessmen on a board to help him when making preparatory sketches for his oil paintings. He explained, When I come back from the races, I use these models. I could not get along without them. You can't turn live horses around to get proper effects of light. What is interesting in his method to see and observe goes beyond just a mere understanding on the effects of light. If the objects were placed on a checkerboard, then Degas may have also applied the Renaissance concept of a grid floor to determine placements, viewing perspectives, and distances. By the 1880s, Degas was making good use of recently published stop-action photographs, which captured movement too fleeting to be perceived by the naked eye, and which increased the artist's understanding of the horse in motion. Note the second row, the second action shot from the left. Degas would use this still for the creation of this small counterproof drawing. Throughout his career, Degas printed drawings by rubbing the surface of a blank sheet of paper placed over a chalk drawing so that a reverse image transferred to the clean paper. This transferred image is called a counterproof. Degas went over the blurry counterproof impression with both black and red chalk. Yet, as with many artists studying the horse, drawing from the life or the direct observance of a living horse is always practical and invaluable. In 1899, while undergoing treatment for alcoholism at a sanitarium on the outskirts of Paris, Lautrec produced an ambitious group of crayon chalk drawings of circus figures. These sketches were drawn entirely from his imagination without recourse to preliminary studies, photos, or other visual reference sources. Thanks to these circus drawings, Lautrec earned his release from the sanitarium. Impressed by the handling of these drawings, the doctors were convinced of his health and allowed him to leave the medical facility.
In 1872, Leland Stanford, the railroad magnate, former governor of California, and founder of Stanford University, hired Edward Mewbridge to prove whether all four hooves of a horse would leave the ground all at once during a gallop. Mewbridge would not begin Stanford's project until five years later, in 1877, since he faced a trial and served jail time for murdering a man, which he was soon acquitted afterwards. The photographer wasted no time to work on Stanford's project and to undertake the scientific studies of the gates of horses at a trot and gallop. The horses employed for the experiment were Stanford's own prized animals, the tycoon-bred standard-bred horses as racing trotters and thoroughbreds for course racing. In 1878, a year later, the first images were successfully captured. The illustrative chart on the left straightforwardly describes the original setup. Pause the lecture now if you wish to zoom in and read it. In the first attempt experiment, Mewbridge would use Stanford's champion trotter, Abe Edgington, to set off the timing releases of an electric charge which would trip the camera shutters. The shutter mechanisms were triggered by specially placed wires on the ground when the wheels of the sulky rolled over them. With the success of this setup, Mewbridge then photographed Stanford's racehorse named Sally Gardner to gallop along the screen wall with the trip wires raised a little higher to the horse's chest. The outcome was called automatic electrophotographs. More importantly, the evidence was certain that all four legs of a galloping horse did leave the ground. These successive images were quickly published onto cardstock, copyrighted, and sold in small series of photographic prints called the Horse in Motion. Mewbridge's invention was immediately and enthusiastically published worldwide in magazines and newspapers. However, Mewbridge did not stop there. The British photographer would make another remarkable discovery. He would create the very first assembly of photographs to produce the very first motion film ever. It would be a two-second clip of a black man whose identity has been unfortunately never noted and lost over time, riding the same racehorse, Sally Gardner, at a full gallop. This was made possible by Mewbridge's new invention of the Zoo Praxiscope, a hand-cranked device which allowed a disk of images to be passed by the human eye in rapid succession. From 1878 onwards, Mewbridge would continue filming countless motion photography sequences of every action possible, completing all the variable gates of the horse, documenting the movements of a variety of animals and also of human beings. The extensive accumulation of images would lead Mewbridge in 1887 to publish Animal Locomotion, with the backing of the University of Pennsylvania. This magnum opus included 781 colotypes. The publication became a must-have throughout the world, not only for artists, but for doctors, scientists, horse trainers and owners, zoologists, collectors of photographs, and for the early pioneers of cinematography. Examples of sequential animation for Mewbridge's plates follow.
This concludes The Artist's Horse, Chapter 13 of Lecture Series Number 3, The Horse in European Art. To watch more art appreciation study programs like this, go to European Artist Heritage and experience a variety of comprehensible presentations that provide quality art learning with substance.